The Christadelphians present This is Your Bible, a program dedicated to the study of your Bible to learn about the wonderful future that God has planned for this earth. Join us now as we open up the Bible and reason together around God's Word. Hello, I'm Christian Russell, and on behalf of the Christadelphians, I'd like to welcome you to another episode of This Is Your Bible. Have you ever wondered why the Middle East is always front page news? It seems that nations are concerned whether it's a region in conflict or in peace. And our guest today is going to help us look at why. So don't go away, we'll be right back to look at this important subject. I don't know what your idea of paradise is. We all have our own views on the subject, but I think that most would agree the scenes we are looking at could be described as a touch of paradise. The Creator made this earth a paradise originally, and then mankind spoiled it by trying to do things his own self-centered way. Mankind has ever since tried to create his own paradise, one in which man is glorified and the Creator is forgotten. All around us we can see grim reminders of the remoteness of paradise, reminders that man without God cannot bridge that distance to the true paradise. In the Bible, in the book of Genesis, we're told that the original creation made by God was very good. We are also told that throughout the Bible that the world will be very good again when Jesus Christ returns to establish the kingdom of God on the earth. In Psalm 72 it says, He, Christ, shall deliver the needy when he cries, the poor also and him that has no helper. He will redeem their life from oppression and violence. In Isaiah 35, The desert shall rejoice and blossom as a rose. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like a deer, and the tongue of the dumb sing. And in the book of Revelation, there shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain. Sounds good, doesn't it? This is what the Bible has to say about the good things to come. You can learn more about the message of the Bible and your part in God's plan by signing up for our free online Bible courses at thisisyourbible.com. Just click on the Learn More tab and register for Exploring the Bible. Yes, the Bible does tell us that there will be a true paradise here, again, on earth, soon. Will you be ready? Welcome back. Thank you for joining us again. With us in our studio, we have a friend and Bible student, David Wisniewski. David, welcome. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for being here. David, what's the best way for us to approach this difficult subject from a biblical standpoint? Well, the subject is best approached keeping three principles in mind. First principle would be that God rules in the kingdoms of men. The second principle is that Israel as a nation is God's witness. And the third is that Jerusalem is God's city, actually. Okay, so those are three underlying principles from the Bible that we need to look at and understand uh, in order to understand this difficult subject. How about like, taking a look at the Bible to show us some Bible proofs for those points? Sure. The first one would be in Daniel chapter 5, and that is God ruling in the kingdoms of men. Okay. Now, the context of Daniel 5 is you have the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, one of the greatest uh, nations at the time. And Nebuchadnezzar is standing upon his porch. He's looking at the kingdom around him. And he says to himself, what a wonderful kingdom this is that I have built. It says he's lifted up in his pride in verse 20 of Daniel chapter 5. And the very next verse we read in verse 21 is, and he was driven from the sons of men, and his heart was made like the beasts, and his dwelling was with the wild asses. And they fed him with grass like oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven until he knew that the Most High God ruled in the kingdom of men, and that he appointeth over it whomsoever he will. So the king of Babylon, lifted up in his pride over the wonderful kingdom that he thought he had established, was forced to be as a wild beast, eating amongst them like a crazy man, until it came to him, until he realized that it's God who rules in the kingdoms of men, and God had appointed him that position as king over Babylon. So he's recognized this principle that God rules in the kingdoms of men, that was obviously then. Does that apply 
in the, the, the that was the past. What about the, the present? Absolutely. Yeah. Everything we see, the Middle East, the Middle East that it appears on the front page of our newspapers day by day, is a loud and clear warning to Christians worldwide of the things that God has laid out in His plan for this earth. So there's, there's tremendous implications for us just on just accepting that one and recognizing that one principle that the world that we live in is, is actually, to a certain and large extent, governed by God and God's control. Yes, as, as hard as that is for us to accept sometimes, that is the case. What about the second principle, that Israel, uh, Israel is, is God's witness? Well, for that we turn over to Isaiah 43. There's not much context we can give, it's pretty plainly stated. The prophecy of Isaiah chapter 43. Just so we understand who we're talking about, we're going to look at verses 9 and 10. But to understand who it is is the subject of this, we turn to verse 1 of Isaiah 43. But now, thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee, I have called thee by thy name, thou art mine. And then skipping down to verse 9, let the, all the nations be gathered together, and let the people be assembled. Who among them can declare this and show us former things? Let them bring forth their witnesses that they may be justified, or let them hear and say it is truth. Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. So you see the challenge he's making to the nations. Show me your witness. I'll show you my witness. My witness is the nation of Israel. And by what happens to that nation, you know that I rule in the kingdoms of men. And the reason why we can't just, just dispute this as being, oh, that was then and, and this is now, is because this is a promise. This is saying, I, you will be my witness as well as you are my witness. Correct. Okay, and so uh, I, <laughs> I have to say, though, I, I know a lot of people don't like hearing that, that or acknowledging that in today's, in the Middle East, that uh, the nation of Israel is still cared for or loved by God. I know it's a difficult, a difficult uh, topic for many people to a accept. It is, and I think what has to be realized is that just because they are his witness does not mean that God condones all their actions. Right, and that's what's important for, I think, our viewers to understand yes. uh, in, when we're looking at this subject. Okay, so we've, we've seen, for example, you said that God rules in the kingdoms of men. We've seen the, that Israel is, is God's witness mm -hmm. uh, as the second principle. And the third principle, again, was uh, that Jerusalem is, is, is God's city. Yes. Okay, the proofs for that. The proofs for that are found first in Psalm 132, and we'll look at a couple of verses to show this. Because I know that, that Jerusalem has been a city that has probably suffered more invasions and conquests than any other city in the world. That is very true. So, so, so who's, you know, the question is, whose city is it? Right, and the Bible answers that for us. The first answer that we're going to look at actually comes with a man, David, who has been made king over Israel and Judah and is tossing in his sleep at night. He can't sleep. He's trying to determine where to set up the head of the kingdom. And the answer finally comes to him in verse 13 of Psalm 132. For the Lord hath chosen Zion, that is Jerusalem. He hath desired it for his habitation. Zion being the name of a mountain, I thought. Yes, in, okay. the, in the vicinity of Jerusalem. And, and when we know that, uh, I think it's what we said, David, uh, we've, we've said that David uh, um, set up his, his kingdom. He set up his kingdom in, in Jerusalem. Jerusalem, which was, and then Mount Zion is equated Mount to Zion that. Is equated okay. to that. So prophetically, when the Bible speaks of Zion, it is talking about Jerusalem. Okay. Then if we turn over, we'll see that it's actually expanded beyond just the city of Jerusalem to the whole land of Israel in Ezekiel 38. Ezekiel 38 and verse 14, picking up there for context. Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say unto Gog, Thus saith the Lord God, In that day when my people of Israel dwelleth safely, shalt thou not know it? So Gog, we're not going to get too much into Gog right now, except to say in the you? next verse, they're people that come from the north. Okay, so they're, they're an invading... They're an invading force. Okay. In verse 15, And thou shalt come from thy place out of the north parts, thou and many people with thee, a great army. In verse 16, And thou shalt come up against my people of Israel, 
as a cloud to cover the land, it shall be in the latter days, and I will bring thee against my land, that the heathen may know me, when I shall be sanctified in thee, O Gog, before their eyes. So tying back in really with that second principle as well, that, that Israel is God's witness also, not just the people, but the land now. The land itself. Okay, and, and then Jerusalem, Zion is, is his chosen habitation. Is his chosen habitation, okay. absolutely. And then one last verse to tie these together is in Zechariah chapter 8. Zechariah 8, verses 2 and 3. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I was jealous for Zion with great jealousy, and I was jealous for her with great fury. Thus saith the Lord, I am returned unto Zion and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. And Jerusalem shall be called a city of truth and the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. And there we have the equation between Zion and Jerusalem as well. Okay. So, so those are the three principles you're saying to, as, as the foundation for us to understand why the Middle East is, is in conflict today is to understand that God rules in the kingdoms of men. You, we looked at some ver a verse that, that proved that, uh, that Israel is God's witness, mm -hmm. both in the past and then in, in, in the present, and, and has to be today. Yes. And then finally, that the land and, and Jerusalem belong to God. That's right. Um, okay, so those are the principles, but why is there such a conflict? Haven't we just seen then that the Bible proves that this, essentially the land belongs to the Jews? The Bible does prove that, but of course there's always perspective. It actually goes all the way back to a man named Abraham, a man who is considered the father of the faithful for Christians, for Jews, and for Islamic people. Okay. They all trace their routes back to Abraham. What I'll look at now just briefly is how the promises were made to Abraham back in Genesis chapter 12, okay. and then we'll look at how both Jew and Christians see that those promises were passed on, promises that have to do with a land, that is the Middle East, were passed on through a son named Isaac, but that the Arab people consider that those promises were actually passed on through a son named Ishmael. So we're going back to the root of the conflict you're saying is based on a promise. Right. Okay. A promise, promise, that to, promise to Abraham. Included a land and his people living in it forever. Okay. Okay, so where are we? So it starts in Genesis 12, verse 1, is really the okay. first interaction we have with this man, Abraham. At this point, his name is Abram, as we'll read here. His name has later changed to Abraham. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing and I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Now this promise is expanded on when we turn over just a couple of pages to Genesis chapter 15. So, so we've got here a promise, though, before I take a look at that, that says that there's a promise to Abraham of, of a land yes. and of a, a, a great dis, uh, number of descendants right. and protection from God. Yes. Uh, uh, okay. Those three things are established in the first promise. Okay, so, so Genesis chapter 15. You and as the promises to Abraham are given over several chapters in Genesis, we have a building upon these first promises that are stated. All right. So in, in chapter 15 and verse 18 to 21, we actually have a layout of the land that's given. Verse 18, In the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenites and the Kenizzites and the Cadmonites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Rephaims and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Girgashites and the Jebusites. Now those were nations that existed back in Abraham's day, okay. but the important part there is in verse 18, the extent of that land is laid out. Now I've brought with me here a map that I wanted to show you that really shows the extent to which Abraham was promised back here in Genesis chapter 15. Okay. But that's surely a much larger area than they possess now or probably have ever possessed in their history. I was hoping you would notice that. That is true. So what that tells us is that whoever's right that land is, of course we believe the right of that land belongs to Israel, whoever's right that land is, the eventual extent of that land is going to be much larger than what we currently see as the nation of Israel. 
and it yet has be to be fulfilled, these promises then that were made to Abraham. Okay, so the promises made to Abraham consist of, of a people and a land. Right. But that doesn't explain the conflict. Well, it's the precursor to the conflict. Okay. As I said, the promises of this land and of who these people were passed on according to the Bible to a son named Isaac. But the right. Arab people deny that that's the case. Why? They believe that the Bible, the, their Bible, the Quran, teaches that the promises were actually passed on through a son named Ishmael, who was actually the firstborn son. But in the Bible, we're told that Ishmael was rejected and that Isaac was the son of Be promise. Because, because the lineage or the descendancy went down to the firstborn. So you're saying the firstborn was, was not Isaac, it was actually Ishmael. That is correct. And normally it did go to the firstborn, Ishmael but, in this case, but because God looks at the heart of people and saw that Ishmael's heart was not right, those promises instead were passed on to Isaac. So what you're saying, uh, just to summarize these points so far, is that these promises made to Abraham, uh, fundamental promises obviously, uh, bedrock of, of scripture, mm -hmm. uh, the, the, these biblical promises were made to Abraham to follow through one of his sons. Correct. And, and there's, the Bible says that it was the son of promise was, was Isaac. Yes. And, the, and Muslims, uh, they, they believe that the son of promise was Ishmael. That is correct. Okay, so hence now two the large conflict. nation, two large groups of people yes. who believe that they should inherit that land. Both believe that they have rights to okay. the same land because of these promises that God made to Abraham. And Jerusalem is the core. They always say that Jerusalem is the core of the conflict. Right. Um, and and uh, that's because Jerusalem is the, is the, is the Zionist, this holy hill. It's uh, always been the headquarters, so to speak, the, the capital of the, that holy the capital. land. Okay. Yes. So that's, that's then the root of the conflict because they, they, those, both those people feel that they have, uh, a feel they have a claim on that land. Okay, so that was the past, but that's a long time ago. Uh, surely has, haven't, shouldn't things have you know, been sorted out by now? Uh, how do we get to today? Uh, where are we now? Well, of course, a lot has happened since that day. And part of the problem behind this conflict um, starts with something that was prophesied in Deuteronomy chapter 28, okay. is that Israel, who did inhabit the land historically, was cast out of that land because of their sins that they had committed. God cast them out of that land, and he scattered them through many nations. And during that time then, the land was left open for other peoples and their Arab nations that surrounded them were the ones who eventually moved in and inhabited that land. Take a look at Deuteronomy 28. And we'll look at three verses there, 64 to 66. And the Lord shall scatter thee, again he's talking to Israel here, the Lord shall scatter thee among all people from the one end of the earth even unto the other, and there thou shalt serve other gods, which neither thou nor thy fathers had known, even wood and stone. And among these nations shalt thou find no ease, neither shall the sole of thy foot have rest. But the Lord shall give thee a trembling heart, and failing of eyes, and sorrow of mind, and thy life shall hang in doubt before thee, and thou shalt fear day and night, and shalt have none assurance of thy life. That's a, those are pretty strong words. It's a pretty uh, tough Punishment. It was a very tough punishment, but Israel at this point in time in Deuteronomy was standing on the edge of a land that God had promised them. And he told them, if you go into this land and are obedient to my word, if you meditate upon my word and make it the guiding part of your life, then I will give you this land forever. If you don't, the verses that we've read, they would be scattered from all nations. And we see that today, don't we? We see Jews that exist in all nations of the world because yep. of this prophecy being fulfilled. So this prophecy has been fulfilled and the, and the Jews, are, uh, our, obviously our lifetime has, has only seen sort of more recent history of, of the Jews, but we know from, from the history of the last hundred years certainly that they were certainly very persecuted yes. and, uh, and put trembling of heart, failing eyes, anguish of soul, life hanging in doubt before you. It's almost as if you can picture uh, the concentration camps that they yes. were forced into and and so, so this has been fulfilled. Right. Um, it's a grave picture. It's been fulfilled. But we've got another prophecy then which follows on from this. Remember, okay. Israel 
is God's witness. So he's not going to cut them off completely, as some people would, would believe. When we turn over to the prophecy of Jeremiah, in chapter 30, we see that God's plan and purpose with Israel was not finished in that day. And we'll look at verse 10 and 11 for context. Therefore fear thou not, O my servant Jacob, saith the Lord, neither be dismayed, O Israel, for I will save thee from afar and thy seed from the land of captivity. Remember Deuteronomy 28, you'll be captive in all nations. You'll be scattered. You'll be scattered. Right. Jeremiah, I will bring thee from the land of captivity, and Jacob shall return and shall be in rest and be quiet, and none shall make him afraid. For I am with thee, saith the Lord, to save thee. And though I make a full end of all nations, whither I have scattered thee, yet will I not make a full end of thee, but I will correct thee in measure and not leave thee altogether unpunished. It's important to note that the nation that was ruling in these days was the Babylonians. Where are the Babylonians today? Could barely find them, I think. Uh, archaeologists had to hunt. That's right. From what I understand. So they don't exist as a nation in our day. Right. The memory of them, except for the recorded memory, is, is slim. And that's a f perfect fulfillment of what is stated here, that God would make an end of the nations that scattered Israel. He would make an end of those nations, but Israel would still exist as a nation. He would bring them back once again. It wasn't just the Babylonians, though. It was also... The Other nations, right? Assyrians. The Assyrians were before that. The Assyrians, you'll recall, were the ones who took away the ten tribes to the north. And, and their practice was very similar to the Babylonians. What they would do is they would disperse them so that they couldn't regroup and that they couldn't start a colony again, so to, to speak, keep, to keep and them rebel. Weak. It to was keep to keep them, them weak. Right. And then, then the Romans did that uh, as The Assyrians as well. and the Babylonians, and then, yes, the final... A doomsday, so to speak, of the Jewish people in the land was in AD 70, and that was by the Romans when they came down and, and decimated the city of Jerusalem. And what exactly was the pre precipitated the reestablishment then of the nation of Israel? In our day, yeah. you're referring to. What established that was actually powers, um, and you see God ruling in the kingdoms of men here. It really had to do with uh, certain elements within the British government that uh, were the forces that brought Zionism to a head and then brought about the return of Jews after World War II, uh, brought them back into the land, giving them a place where they could live because they had been rejected from much of Europe. So a sympathy after the Second World War. Yes. Uh, a sympathy amongst the, the probably the United Nations at the time, was it? Yes. Um, gave them a land. Right. I, it's, it's interesting because we very often do hear of uh, or read of in history nations that going back to this point about God ruling in the kingdoms of men, uh, nations who are brought to nothing over seemingly innocuous uh, events, uh, yes. simple things. It uh, is amazing. And, and, but it's those events of, of the Second World War, those catastrophic events right. that precipitated the return, of the reestablishment of Israel to the land, which was a, a fulfillment of this prophecy. A fulfillment okay. of this prophecy. Okay. And we think then a little bit later on in history, more current to our day perhaps, in 1967 then was the Six Day War in which they overtook the city of Jerusalem again. Okay. Remember, God said that is my, my city right. and those are my people. So uh, as hard as that is for some people to accept, the Bible plainly teaches us that it is the Jews that belong in that land. Right, okay, so that's, that's past, uh, that's past uh, ancient history and, and past recent history. What about the future? Well, I'm glad you asked about the future. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 24. So I take it if it's in the New Testament, I mean, these must be, must be words of Jesus. These are words of Christ, yes. When we turn to Matthew 24, we'll take a look at verse 30 of Matthew 24. Okay. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather his elect from the four winds, from the one end of heaven to the other. Now, what is being said here, the language is a little bit figurative, but the title, the Son of Man, is a title of the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's saying that when the Lord Jesus Christ appears, and there's the gathering of his elect from the four winds, is talking about the resurrection from the dead, that those who are his saints will be gathered together with him, he says, this is going to happen. And in verse 32, he tells a parable 
is going to be the sign that these things are about to come to pass. Okay. And look at what the sign is. Now, learn a parable of the fig tree. The fig tree is always, in these scriptures, representative of the nation of Israel. Fortunately, we don't have the time to look at passages that support that right now. But scripturally, the, the figure of the fig tree is one that represents Israel. When his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, ye know that summer is nigh. So likewise, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near even at the doors. So the parable there, the fig tree, is one of it just putting forth its leaves. And we have a picture there of Israel in the land just being established as a nation. New, new growth, springtime. There's new growth, springtime. And you know that summer is nigh. Christ says, likewise, when ye see these things, when you see Israel come back into the land, know that it is near even at the door. What's near? The return of Christ. Look at verse 34. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. So not a generation would pass from the time that they were regathered as a nation and took Jerusalem as their capital city again. We're told that within a generation of that, and that's a fairly loosely defined word, but within a generation we would have the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, the resurrection from the dead, and the establishment of his kingdom upon the earth. It's interesting. You know, We always would love to have a date but there's obviously a reason why he doesn't give us a date and, and has us look for this picture. Yes. What is that? The reason, the, the reason for that, just briefly. It's very important because the reason we're not told is so that we can't plan. You know how our right. nature is. Right. If we know exactly when it's going to be, our nature is to, to let things slide, to slacken until the time it's like studying for an exam. Right. We know when the exam is, so we goof off until the last hour and now we know we need to get down to brass tacks and start studying. I'll, I'll, I'll get around to it. Yeah. You'll get around. Yeah, That's exactly it. Even He even says that further on in this chapter in verse 44, Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not the Son of Man cometh. Those signs are there. God is working in the kingdoms of men. God has Israel as his witness, and that witness is there to alert believers of his word that Christ's return is soon at hand so that we can prepare ourselves and our households. So what you're saying is that uh, the reason why it's important for us to understand Middle East uh, conflict is because it's at such a time of, of uh, conflict followed by a time of peace that we anticipate the possible return, uh, the, the promised return of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is correct. Well, David, thank you very much for taking the time to be with us and joining us and helping us through this subject. It's, uh, we hope that we've been able to show you uh, that from the Bible, the roots of this problem, how, as David made those principles uh, clear, that God rules in the kingdoms of men and that uh, Jerusalem is a promised city, will be the throne of his kingdom. We hope that we've been able to convince you of that. There is some free literature that we have on offer. Uh, that information will come up in just a few minutes at the end of this show. And uh, thank you for joining us. We look forward to, to seeing you again on another episode of This Is Your Bible. The This Is Your Bible series of television programs is brought to you by the Christadelphians to stimulate you to search the scriptures for God's truths. We believe the Holy Bible is the inspired word of God and reveals a wonderful plan for salvation to believing men and women. Although it was written by different people over a span of 1600 years, the message is the same from beginning to end. To realize this book contains God's Word is to begin to understand its importance and our need and responsibility to study it. For pamphlets and articles on this subject and other Bible subjects, go to www.thisisyourbible.com, click on the Library tab, and select from Basic Bible Teaching, Bible Study, Doctrine, Life, Prophecy, The Christadelphians. In addition to our library, ThisIsYourBible.com offers online Bible study courses and Bible answers to your questions. Select www.thisisyourbible.com to increase your understanding of God's Word and learn about His future kingdom on the earth.